Mängu studio GameCan asute tegev juht. Meie event on saanud väga palju huvi, mille üle meil on hea meel. Sadu noori on ennast kirja pannud ja me anname endast parima, et veidi seletada, mida see mängu tööstus endast kujutab, kuidas sinna saab, miks sinna peaks tahtma ja võibolla, et mis on esimesed sammud enne erinevate karjääride suhtes. Speakrid, kes meil täna on. Esimesena alustab Matjas Vlassov, kes on siis Gamecanni kunstiline juht, ehk siis aartdirektor. Tema järel on Peter Westerbaka, mees, kes on siis kogu Angry Birdsi brändi taga. Järgmisena 955 on Aviv Ben Yehuda, Bigger Games looja ja tegev juht. 10-10 on Oit Madis Osalit, Placeholder Gameworks mängulooja ja 10.25 siis Flavio Pontes, kes on Gamecanni tehniline juht, ehk CTO. Kõige olulisem asja, et kindlasti Facebooki laivis seal küsimusi küsiksite, et kuidas see üles ehitatud on nii, et igal esineel on 15 minutit, nad on umbes planeerinud 10 minutit rääkida, Ja kui nad on sellega lõpetanud, siis ma loodan, et ma leian sealt Facebooki laivealt erinevalt küsimusi, mis ma neil esitada saan, mis nad saad sellele vastata. Mattis ja Ott räägivad eesti keeles, Peter, Aviv ja Flavia räägivad inglise keeles. Ja ma lasen iga ühel ise ennast tutvustada. Osad jagavad ka ekraani, jagavad slaide. Flavia lõpus näiteks näitab, mida 20 minutiga Unreal Engine teha saab mille üle ma olen ka väga põnevilt, ma ei tea, mida ta konkreetselt plaaninud on. Ja rohkem olulist infot ei olegi introks, et Mattias, lava on sinu. Nii, kus sa näetame ekraani? Tere! Minu nimi on Mattes Jahan Vlasov. Ma olen viimased kaks ja pool aastat töötanud kunstilise ühina videomängu studius Gamecan. Ja kümme viitsest minti räägin siis, et kuidas ma sattusin mängu tööstusesse, mis teeb mängu tööstuse kõige šefi muks tööstuseks üldse. Ma olen selle, et saab tööõrus mänge mängida. Ja ma räägin natuke endast ja minu teekonnast, mis mind juhatas siia, kus ma praegu olen, millised õpetus sõnu teepeal külge jäid. Ja ma alustaks kõige algusest. Seal on mina, väike maitis. Ma sündisin ihuslikult kuisniku perekonda. Paps on mul fotograaf. Ta on oma fotostuudio, kus ma noorpõlus kõik ja kogu aeg tüütasin teesuguste küsimuste eesolemistega. Mamps on mul maalikunstnik. Ma arvan, et temalt ma pärisin kõik selle huvi joonistamise vastu. Ma joonistisin absoluutselt kogu aeg igale poole. Ma jõunistasin seintele, ma jõunistasin põrandatele, mitte lihtsalt kriitide või markeritega või aarusoolidega või seinavärvidega. Nii et pärast pidi kõik seinad uuesti üle värvima, õnneks põrande pealt värve lõpuks kulus maha. Mul meeldis raamatud ümber jõunistada, kuna mul oli huvi ka geograafia loodus vastu, siis ma jõunistasin ensuklopeedatest igasuguseid loomi ja skeeme maha. Huvi oli nii suur, et ma läksin isegi kunsti kooli. Käisin seal umbes nädal aega, ütlen ausalt, et natuurmordide maalimine ei ole minu rida ja sinna see jäi. Aga kogu mu digitaalse kunsti poolse alguse, ma mõletan seda päeva päris täpselt kus juures. Ma arvan, et ma olin esimeses klassis, läksin peale kooli papsi studiosse, see oli täpselt mu kooli kõrval. Mu onupaeg, kes on must tükkmaad vanem, oli ka parasugust uudus. Ta hängis seal alal lõppmata ning näitas mulle ühte pilti, mis ta oli just teinud. Pilt oli tehtud studiu ees ja teda oli kolm tikku ühe pildi peal. See kahjuks pole see õige foto, aga ma pole neid polnud fotis alles enam. Aga see oli üks hetk, kus ma aju lihtsalt plahvatas. Toega oli see nagu mingi maagia. Käisin tal järgmised nädal aega pinda nagu uni, et ta näitaks mulle, kuidas ta seda tegi. Aga ta ei õpetanud ja jumma oli siis liiga noor või midagi. Aga istusin esimesel vaval hetkel studios arvuti taha, tõmbasin Photoshopi käima ja üritasin ise midagi samasugust teha. Esimesed paar päeva ma lihtsalt näppisin kõik nuppe ja mul pand 
Hall Laimu küsma, mida üldse ma siin teen. Ja, aga uudisimu oli nii õhker, et alla anda. Aga ma ei, ega ma ei tea, kui palju ma varem olin üldse arvutid kasutanud. Too aeg vist kodus arvutid ei olnud, aga lõpuks ma sain hakkama ja tegin omale samasuguse pildi. Üks pildi siis. Aga ma tegin sellise sarased pilte kümneid, kuna see ainu käsi, mis ma tolle ajal Photoshopis oskasin. Ja see oli minu uskiga lähed, ma isegi ka Photoshopis üldse teha. Ja siit algeski minu kirglik huvi fotograafia ja piltide töötamise vastu. Sain papsilt oma esimese kaamera. See oli mingi vana filmikas Smeena, kus üres ma nängin seda kaamerat muusiumis, kui ma keskkoolis käisin. Ühesõnaga ma mäletan täpselt, mis paps ütles mulle enne, kui ta selle kaamera endis mulle õpetussõna, mis minu ka siia nii kaasas käib. Ära lihtsalt vaata, vaid märka. Ma hiljem räägin siis, kuidas ma seda õpetussõna rakendan. Aga ühesõnaga hakkasime sõpredega pillistama ja photoshopima. Shopisime endale igasuguseid koljanäkku, otsisime internetist igasuguseid rõvedeid, vanu tapeid, tapeidi pilte ja üritisime omale näkku tuunida, et jääks mulle nagu nahk praguneks. Ega sõikest värki. Sain koolis sujuvalt oma uud hobi rakendada, kui kodutööks anti teha näiteks mingi plakat või pidi klassi õhtu jaoks meesterdama midagi siis selle asemel, et midagi kokku liimida ja makarane värvida, asime Photoshopi kumaks. Ja kus üles ma liitsin ühe pildi mingist ajast, mis me sõbrage tegime, vähe uuem aega ma arvan, et see oli mingi 2012 midagi. Ühe sõnaga, et oli vaja kodutööna teha reklaamplakat, vabalt valitud kohalikule ettevõttele. See oli siis mingi majandus või ettevõtlustund või midagi sellist. Ja kuna meil vedeles toa nurgas hunnik hoki käppe kohalikult Pärnu ettevõttel, siis mõtlesime, et ta ei tee midagi, sellest midagi. Ja siin siis soovid käppi, fronteeri hoki käppi taastas 2001. See plakat rippub vist siia maani kellegi juures. Lõpuks, kui tegi suhuvalt hakkas tööd sisse tulema, läbi papsi, läbi tuttavad, et oleks vaja postrit kujundada, oleks vaja logo kujundada ja need edasi, need edasi. Aga millega pärast ma kunagi ei mälnud, et sellest võiks omale karjääri loom hakata. Tegin igasugused muiteid, müüsin jäetlist, müüsin naelehti, natuke vanemana hoolesin tee ääri. Olin isegi mõndagi vettel päästi. Hakkasin nemad tuleviku peale mõtlema alles kaitseväes, kui seal kaheksa kuud metsas kükitasin ja sügavalt elvõrgi üle mõtlesin, mõtlesin, et kõrad tegelikult päris sõff oleks hobis töökoht välja mäda. Ja peal kaitsevega saatsin mingi miljon CV tööandjatele, kes tegelevad igasuguste reklaamide, veebilehtede, igasugust üks teemaga. Üks vastas, pakkus veebilehe kujunda ameti kohta, et äkki ma saan tulevikus, äkki ma saan nädala jooksul siis teha mingi demo veebilehe kujunduse kohta välja mõeldud kinnisvara piroole. Pole elu sees ühtegi veebilehte kujundanud. Ütlesin, et ta vaib avalt pole probleemi. Järgmise paar päevi üritasin aru saada, mida veebi kujundamine üldse tähendab endast. Tegin omale selliks igasuguseid reeglid, tõed ja alustasin esimese demo veebilehe kujundamisega. Ütleks, et tagasi vaadates oli isegi natuke paha peale vaadata, aga Toek ma endasin nendes kõik ja see oli piisav, et mind tööle võetaks. See oli ma esimene päris töö selles vallas ja ma olin päris uhkend üle, uhke kontor ja tähtsad miitingud ja suured projektid ja töötasin umbes üks ja pool aastat. Selles ettevõttes mõtleks, et see töökogemus kahe kordistas mu skilli kindlasti kui mitte rohkem. Ja mul oli mega hea meel, et ma hüppasin selle töökogemuse nimel peaaes vette ja tulin sealt sellise kogemuste pagasiga välja. Peale seda tegemist ma alustasin oma karjääri freelancerina. See põhimõtteliselt tähendab, et sa disenda boss, otsid erinevaid tööotsi, minu puhul kujunduse tööotsi, ärkad mille tahad ja need asid. See oli päris fun. Sai palju erinevate projektidega tegeleda. See oligi selline selle perioodi äge osa. Töötasin erinevate start-upidega, alustavate ettevõttega, pain rõhku ise enda projektidele. Rääkides ise enda projektides siis on päris hea, et ma ei pea endale, ei pea omale kujundat palkama. Et kohe kui midagi pähe tuleb, siis ma saan selle teoks teha. Näiteks meil on sõpredega seiliskond, mängime tihti track mainet, see on üks chef rally mäng. Ja me oleme päris võistlusimulised. Ja üks hetk me jõudsime nii kaugele, et me hakkasime Eesti raaja rekordid üle sõitma. Ja ma sõitsin esimesene, siis sealt selskonnasse Eesti rekordid üle. 
ja mõtlesin, et õigel Eesti meistri peab ikka olema oma tool. Ja ma tegin oma tooli. Because I can. Minu pult pidur siit unista. Tagasi tulles mu freelanceri teema juurde. Viimane projekt tole, tolel perioodil oli Martinilt. Ta on siis videomängust, videomängust uudio Game Gen juht. Tal on ka tantsukool Black and Browni ja küsis, kas ma tahaks tema tantsukoolile veebi leheda. Ma ütlesin, et ta ei teeme ära. Kui leht valmis sai, siis küsis, kas ma kunstilise juhi ameti kohast ei oleks huvitatud Game Gennis. Ja ma tegin selle veebi lehe hästi valmis siis. See oli, see oli teine kord mu karjääri jooksul, kus ma aju lahvatas. Ilmselgelt ma tahan kunstilisi juhi ameti kohta saada. Isegi mitte, ise mitte midagi sest maailmast, tead, sest maailmast teades, aga ma ei nõus jälle peaaes vette õppama ja ujuma. Me olime kunagi varem rääkinud mängu tõestusest ja selle oma pärasustest, milline on konkurent selles maailmas ja need asja, need asja. Ja mulle ei kõrbu üks lause, mis Martin ütles. Kuskil on alati keegi, kes, roh- kes teeb rohkem tööd ja pingutab rohkem. Ma ütleks, et see lause ei mind kummita. Ma, ma, ma pidin tegema teistöö. Teistöö seisnud selles, et ma valiks mängu sisesese korporatsiooni. Hetkel on mängus siis kolm korporatsiooni. Facecan ja Vector. Ning teeks ühe neist logo ja mõtleks välja korporatsiooni stiili, millist robotid välja näevad, mis värvid ja edasi. Ma valisin Facey. Ma arvan, et ma tegin seda teistööd 30 tundi jutti. Red Bull ühes käes, sest mul kõrbus kummitas see lause, mis Martin ütles, et kuskil on alati, kuskil on alati keegi, kes teeb rohkem tööd ja pingutab rohkem. Ma tassin veendud, et see, kes kuskil rohkem pingutab, see ei kõngeks ära, ma pingutan see kätte. Ja me ei tahtnud võimalus käest lasta. Ja ma sain Game Gunni kunstiliseks juhiks. Ma võin kohe öelda, et see töö on kõige lahedam töö maailmas. Me, me saame tööjõrst mängi mängida. Me saame mängida mänge, mis pole veel letitele, letitele kõnud. Võibolla mitte keeta ja kuuta, aga no, me saame mängida mänge, mida, mida veel pole avalikuse, avalikusel näidatud. Mis teeb, mis teeb selle töökoha eri tägedeks on see, et me, et meie tiim on nagu perekond. Me oleme kokkuhõidev seelskond, meil on ühine kirk teha mänge, mängida mänge. Vahel enne maga mäe, mis tulevad igasugused huvitavad ideed pähe, mida kõike võiks mängu panna ja siis ei jõu hommikud ära oodata, et minna tööle ja teistel u- uuest mõttest rääkida. Minu tegevusalat kunstlise juhina on välja töötada meie mängu visuaalne keel ja hoida seda õigel suunal. Me teeme koostööd mitmete erinevate ettevõtete ja studiotega. Mina olen siis see vahel üli, kes dirigeerib, milline noh, välja nägema tellitud tulemus, erinevad 3D mudelid, tekstuurid, värvide stiilid. Saan hästi ära kasutada teadmisi, kogemusi, mis on juba kogutud varese seas. Näiteks lause, mis mu paps ütles, kui, kui, ta mu esi, kui ta andis mulle mu esimese kaamera, et ära lihtsalt vaata vaid märke. See on otsustunud, osutunud üli oluliseks nõuandeks hoida oma silmi lahti aru saada, miks on see, mis ma näen täpselt selgin, nagu see paistab. Näiteks, miks on mõnes kohas puude varjud ruudulised, miks tobi nurgast nii palju nätsumaas on miks mu kõrvaklapp nii üllatunud on ja miks peab olema miljon erisugust polt ja mutrit. See kõik on tühini teadmine, aga see koob peinikest niiti ümber meie teadmiste pagasi, mis tuleb reetsilt kasuks, kui hakata enda maailma looma, mida me sisuliselt teeme ja mängu tõstuses. Mängime jumalat teatud mõttes. See kogemus, mis ma olen saanud seda töötades, on olnud meeletu. Kui mu oskused kasvasid kaks korda agentuuris, kus ma töötasin, siis mängutööstuses töötades on mu oskused vähemalt saaja kordistunud. Ma olen olnud toimekas, ma olen teinud reisilt palju igasuguseid logosi, ma arvan, et need on mingi sadu vähemalt. Ma olen üle 50 robotjere värvind. Ma olen 3D modelleerimisprogrammis pead murnud 3000 tundi. Ma olen kümme erinevate versiooni kasuta liideset teinud. Ma olen juhatanud tiime Brasiiliast, Leedust, Eestist ja ma olen robot ja lume inglet teinud. Ja siin kohal ma tahakski lõpetada ja soovida kõigile häid jõule. Ja Martin, kas sul on küsimus? 
Ja chatist tuli siuke küsimus sulle nagu mis on kõige raskem asi ollas vabakutseline ja loodan et siia dropitakse veel küsimusi meil on tärelt viis minutit aega et sind intervjueerida veel. Oh, yeah. Kõige raskem asi olles freelancer mõtleks et see stress et sa pead hommikul üles ärkama ja otsime endale ise tööd ja seda tööd nõlda koju vedama et saad raha sellest et sul pole kunagi kindlat sellest meid järjekord ees ja see oli vist kõige see stress, mis tekib selle kaosega, mõteks mm-hmm. ja siia kõrvale kohe küsimus mis võibolla annab see hea võrdluse et mis on mängudega seotud tööde nii nöödatud proovikivid ja katsumused, mis kõige raskemad on aga okay, hea küsimus mõteks, et kuna mängutööstus jaguneb Nii mitmes osas on see mängude kirjutamine, kunstiline pool programmeerimine. Seal on igas valdkonnas on tegelikult sükseid väga oma pärasseid ja väga eh, nagu valdkonna siseseid probleemi, mida me juba raske seletada. Aga hmm. mõteks, et kõik need ootamatused et sul on vaja mäng valmis saada teisipäevaks ja siis esmaspäeva õhtul kell üheksa mäng on täiesti puruks ja siis sa pead <laughs> leidma selle aja ja selle nutikuse, et see valmis, et see korda saada selleks viimaseks minutiks Jop. see on olnud meil läbiv probleem ja kuule, siin tuleb päris palju juba küsimusi, nüüd meil on ainult kolm minutit aega, mitte tervelt viis Ähm, oskad see kiiresti öelda, mis on sinu jaoks praegu üks ilusamaid mänge? Red Dead Redemption 2 Nice ähm, Midagi konkreetselt sulle, et kas sa arvad, et kunstnikuna on palju raskem tööd leida mängu tööst, sest kui näiteks programmeerija, ne? Aga hea küsimus Kuna me otsime pidevalt igas uusid programmeerijaid Ja meil on nagu on näha, et tõstus on, on väga vaja kasuse programmeerijad, siis võib olla tõesti on raskem kunstnikuna leida tööd selles maailmas. Võib olla ka sellepärast, et kunstniku eeldused, mis tegelikult väga paljudel inimestel on, on mitte digitaalsed. Programmeerija alustab oma rännakut arvuti tagant enam pealt. Ja, aga kui sa kunstnikuna alustad näiteks nende natuurmortidega ja sul on eeldused, siis nagu kõigele sellele sa pead lisama need digitaalsed oskused. Ja. Nii, paari küsimuse jõksame elaega. Siin on päris palju küsimusi, et kus ta seda õppida saab. Minu taustal siin, ma ei tea, seda praegu näha. Ja, ah, suuse screen share on vist praegu ees. Pane kõrra see kinni, säki on näha. Minu virtuaal tausta on üks link, bit.ly, kaldkriib, sest, game dev. Kui te sinna hüppate, siis meil on väga soe community seal ja seal on eraldi tegelikult getting started kategooria, kuhu siis on listitud, et kuidas erinevad mootoritega alustada, plus te saate küsida erinevates kanalites, et kuidas millega alustada. Aga nüüd siis läheme järgmise inimesega praegu edasi. Kindlasti Mattes, kui on mõni konkreetselt sinu ametiga seotud küsimus pärast, saad näha selle Facebooki live ajal, siis saad võibolla tekstis kommenteerida sinna. Nii. Aga ei sulle, Mattes. Uh, hello, Peter. Hey. Hey there. So, just jumping quickly into it, uh, there's about 10 minutes to talk about your background. And then about five minutes for uh, questions and answers. In the beginning of the event, we already introduced who everyone is. So I'm not going to take more of your stage time. Go. Okay. Very good. Hey, so uh, yeah, uh, good morning to everybody. And it's, uh, it's great to be here. And 
yeah so i was just kind of like thinking about like okay yeah uh, what should i share kind of like this morning and and i think one, one thing um, that i think is very important now when we talk about like uh, games and and games development and and all of that i think that it's always good to kind of like uh, ask ourselves like uh, why uh, we're doing what we're doing and and i think that uh, uh, if i look at uh, the early days of uh, Rovio and actually how uh, Rovio and Angry Birds got started. Uh, I think that there is kind of like some very good uh, lessons and inspiration in there. Uh, so, um, uh, I mean, I, I started my kind of like working uh, life, uh, working for kind of like the original like technology startup. So the one that kind of like Bill and Dave started in their garage in uh, Palo Alto in California in 1939. So, you know, that's like long time before my time. Uh, I always have to say when we have younger people in the audience. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I was working at, uh, and, and that was actually HP. So, I mean, uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard and uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunity to meet with both of them when they were still around. So they were fantastic uh, entrepreneurs. So they started not only HP, you know, Hewlett Packard, that uh, fantastic company that is still around, but they started the whole Silicon Valley. And uh, I think it's good to remember that, okay, that was all the way back in 1939, so like long, long time ago. Uh, so uh, Silicon Valley wasn't started by, you know, Google, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, one of these newcomers. Uh, and uh, yeah, but while I was working there, I organized a game making competition in 2003, also a long time ago. And that was kind of like uh, all the way back when uh, our friends at Nokia uh, were still making phones and uh, they had just come out with their first smartphones and then uh, uh, I organized this game making competition to make the best possible mobile multiplayer game and uh, always like to bring this up because this was, you know, many years before iPhone, before Android, before all of that. And then uh, Niklas, uh, Kim and Jarno, so three young guys from Aalto University here in Helsinki, uh, they took part in this competition and they won the competition. So they won this competition with a game that they made called uh, King of the Cabbage World. And uh, that game you have never heard about because it never came out under that name, but it was actually published by, you know, Ilkka Paananen and his team at Sumea or Digital Chocolate. It had become by then uh, under the name Mole War. Okay, it didn't become like a big uh, hit or anything like that. But uh, it's also a good example of uh, uh, one of the reasons why we've been very successful in games here in Finland, that uh, it's a very tight community, always working very closely together. And even today, you know, like uh, the guys from Rovio, the guys from Supercell, from Small Giant Games, from Seriously, everybody working very tightly together. And I think this is something that's important. But anyway, Niklas and the guys, uh, they won this competition and then uh, they came to me, uh, you know, as organizer, part of jury and all of that. And then they had a very important question that, uh, Peter, we're students here at Aalto. We won the competition. What should we do? And then I told them that, of course, you should do what you love to do. And it was very clear that Niklas and the guys, okay, not only loved playing games, but they loved making games. So I said, okay, uh, you should do what you love. So why don't you start a company to make games? So they started Rovio in 2003. And then over the following six years, you know, so a long time, they made 51 games. And then 11th of December, 2009, Angry Birds that you might have heard about. And that then uh, became uh, this massive hit. Uh, it became also the fastest growing consumer brand uh, ever. So at some point, I mean, we did studies, 93% of everybody in China knew the brand, 91% of everybody in India. So pretty much nine out of 10 people on the planet uh, know the brand. And I think that that is kind of like pretty cool if you think about this, that it started as a student project and then, you know, okay, six years, 51 games. So it wasn't, you know, like the first or second or third game. It was the 52nd game that then became this hit. And I think that is just like my kind of like Silicon Valley story that, uh, you know, it took a while for that to emerge. The same thing with Rovio, that it wasn't like an overnight success story. It actually, you know, took six years, 51 games, and then, you know, like boom, 52nd game, massive hit. And, and, uh, and I think that this is actually typical for most success stories that it takes a lot of effort. It's not like, okay, uh, you make a game one day and then it's like a huge hit. I mean, it's, it's actually super difficult uh, to make hit games. And, and I think that this is actually uh, 
when I hear people telling, uh, uh, you know, the world that oh, they know how to make hit games, uh, they don't. Nobody knows. I mean, it, it's uh, there is, uh, you know, it's it's just uh, like uh, making a hit, you know, song or movie or anything. There is uh, no standard like recipe or anything like that. Uh, so I think that that is something that's important to keep in mind. But yeah, anyway, uh, what I think that is very inspirational about uh, kind of like the Robio and Angry Birds story is that uh, it was started as a student project and it was, you know, like three young guys, uh, Helsinki, Finland, Aalto University, and then, okay, boom, they, they made that happen. And, and, and I think that um, uh, that is uh, uh, what I always kind of like believed in is, is, is first of all, that uh, you should do what you love to do. And I think that this is really, really important. So, I mean, if you love making games, you know, why not make, uh, make you know, uh, games and why not start a company to do that? I, I mean, that's, uh, you know, uh, a great thing to do. Uh, and always uh, what we should always ask ourselves if we are actually enjoying what we are doing. Uh, if we are not, then, you know, like we should do something else. And, and I think that we all have experiences, you know, uh, interacting with companies, interacting with products and services that you can you know, like tell that they've been made by people who actually love what they do. And I think that in no other place is it as important as in games and I mean in entertainment in general. I mean, if you have people who hate, you know, what they do, uh, it's probably not going to be like a very good game. And, and uh, that was actually one thing that we always said that uh, Rovio, that I mean, we're not big believers in like all these like focus groups and stuff like that. But I think that what was very important there that we made games that we love to play ourselves. And I think that this is something that, uh, again, uh, is also kind of like a good, uh, good kind of like rule uh, to, to follow. But yeah, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, then if you look at kind of like the Angry Birds story, uh, as we have made many, many games, so we, then we started to go all in on like uh, Angry Birds, but not just, you know, like the game, but the brand. And we then took the brand everywhere. So. Uh, you know, we started uh, animation, we bought an animation studio, we got into consumer products and uh, we had uh, tens of thousands of different kind of like Angry Birds branded products. At one point, we were by far, by far the most copied brand in China. And, uh, and then I was asked that, okay, Peter, aren't you concerned, you know, about like all the copies? And I said, that actually, I'm not concerned at all because if you're the most copied brand, you're also the most loved brand. And that's like a pretty good place to be. And I would be much, much more concerned if nobody copied, you know, what we're doing. And I think that that applies to kind of like uh, uh, most startups and most, you know, products, most services that if nobody is copying you, then you always have to ask yourself that, okay, uh, am I doing the right thing if nobody cares? Because I think that uh, that's kind of like a very nice form of flattery if somebody copies you, then, you know, like you're you're onto something and, and you're doing something that uh, people actually care and maybe even like love. So I think that's important. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I think that it's probably more interesting to open up for, for like questions. Uh, so uh, that's uh, much more than like uh, listening to just, you know, look, looking at my talking head here. So uh, maybe uh, Martin, we, we have some questions from the audience, more than happy to kind of answer yeah. anything. Uh, first of all, thank you. And uh, there's a question, how much further do you think mobile games can go as the graphical output of a smartphone is limited? Uh, uh, first of all, so uh, I don't see any limits there. I mean, the only limit is, is kind of like uh, our like eyesight, if you think about like, you know, uh, resolutions and all of that. And we're already at the level where, uh, you know, it's, it's the same with like TVs and stuff like that, that's okay. Uh, once you have like, you know, all these uh, HDR, 8K, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then, I mean, at some point it doesn't matter because like the human eye can't like distinguish. So, so I think that that, that is, you know, like uh, one thing. And on the mobile devices, we're kind of like already there. Uh, but then um, uh, I don't think that there's um, uh, any kind of like other limits in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think that... Uh, if you look at the evolution of uh, mobile phones, I mean, I still remember when, uh, you know, sending a text message is like a demo that you could do, you know, and okay, I've been around for a while, but I mean, so, so kind of the thing here, and you, we could build games using that. I think that also like with games, 
uh, we all know that it's not about you know like uh, uh, no matter how amazing your graphics and like designs, if the gameplay sucks, it sucks. And I think that we have many many examples of great games where you know it's it's about the gameplay, it's about the experience. So uh, I don't think that uh, mobile phones are you know limiting us in any way today, like in our our uh, creativity. And I mean, you take uh, take Pokemon Go. I mean, that was uh, like uh, a great, and it still is like a great success story. And it's not because uh, you know uh, you know the amazing graphics, but I mean, it's first of all and foremost, I think it's because it's about the characters and it's about Pokemon. I mean, uh, a lot of people grew up with that, and now it's attracted a lot of new fans on like the mobile devices and all of that. But it's also that the game uh, and the technology was applied in a way that made perfect sense in the Pokemon like universe. I mean, it's just like perfect. And, and, and I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to really uh, take you know, mobile gaming uh, to totally new levels. And it's not about the capability, you know, graphics or processing power. I mean, there will be more and more of that. That's like, you know, obvious, but there's gonna be more uh, sensors. There's, you know, like the whole AR, Thing. Uh, you know, there's so many things that we can do. And I think also that, uh, you know, there, there's so much uh, uh, innovation, so much creativity that you can apply, you know, just having a mobile device that is always with you, you can do so many, many more things with that than, you know, like a console that is stuck under your TV at home. Uh, so uh, I don't think that there's anything that comes close to the mobile, like, platform, if you will. If, if you look at... Um, number of players and then the time spent i mean you can any anywhere anytime just you know like your phone and then you're in the game and you're playing with your friends so i think that uh, uh yeah there's no other platform that even mm. comes close to that nice i agree with that answer uh we have time for two more questions i think uh here, here's one that probably many many people who have the have uh, heard the rovio story have been asking that how were the first 51 games financed were they successful enough to support the company uh what's the story behind that yeah so i mean uh, and, uh rovio like any company and i mean like six years ups and downs so it was like uh, you know uh uh uh, Niklas and the guy started the company, then it grew to, I think, like 100 plus, then went down to like 12 when Angry Birds came out. So if that wouldn't have been successful, then the company and we wouldn't be like here sharing these stories. Uh, so so, uh, so I think that, uh, but then uh, always, you know, like uh, friends and family, you know, like funding, you know, that's kind of like the classic kind of like thing, some external funding and, and uh yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's any, any startup, any company, you go through your like ups and downs. But if you look at the, you also have to kind of like uh, remember that the market kind of like pre-iPhone, pre-app store was very different. So it's not that the games were not amazing and, you know, some amazing, some less amazing, but it's also like the whole market was dominated by, you know, okay, the device makers, but most importantly, like the operators. So there were many, many gatekeepers there and it was super difficult to kind of like get your game out there. I mean, now it's super easy, you know, just, you know, put it in the app store and it's like out there. So it's a different challenge. But uh, back then it was difficult to even get your game out. And I think that uh, uh, that is something that uh, also, you know, if you look at it now, uh, now it's about like making great games. But actually before it was more about like, having access to distribution. So even no matter how good your game was, didn't matter if you couldn't get it out there. At least now you can get your game out there. You can put it in an app store, you can mm -hmm. publish it you know, somewhere. But um, uh, I think that uh, now you have a different challenge that, okay, who cares if you made the best game ever if nobody knows about yeah. it. So you get into the marketing, you know, uh, the branding, the whole like thing. So, so it, it's... Um, it's a different uh, ecosystem altogether, mm -hmm. so you can't really kind of like compare um, kind of like the market back then and what is it now. So I think that that is uh, kind of like the main main uh, difference. So uh, short answer is that some of the games were great; they were even like you know pretty successful, like uh, mm -hmm. the Bob series of games pre-installed on over 200 million Nokia phones. But I think for the 
uh, company it was worth a few tens of K yeah. because it was like a subcontracting kind of like arrangement. So mm. yeah, so different uh, ecosystem, different uh, kind of like business logic, and mm-hmm. uh, the market today is much easier than it was back then. There's actually a lot of very good questions now coming up, but uh, we do need to move on to the next speaker. If you have a moment later, maybe jump into the chat oh, under on. the live and uh, answer a few questions. Uh, I'm also interested in the answers to some sure. of them, but uh, thank you so much. Um, enlightening as uh, always. And let's do this again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, then we're going to jump on to our next speaker, uh, Aviv Ben Yehuda, the CEO and uh, founder of Big Air Games. Yes. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here with my friends that you can see around me. Um, as mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Big Ear Games, so Big Ears. And that's already a clue that we are all about music, right? And um, I, the, the way I would like to, to use the time here is to actually uh, touch the story of how everything went from the beginning, right? And uh, maybe it's like an example, maybe not even a typical example, but an example of how, uh, how many possibilities there are there. And I think most of you are uh, interested uh, uh, or were interested at some point in, in their life with uh, having a career maybe as a, as a developer in computer sciences or even games specifically. So here the story starts when I was actually a very young child uh, attracted to music like many others but I think I was a bit more serious about it because I really wanted to learn to play an instrument and invested a lot of my time into it so I really learned seriously how to play it was drums then and uh, nobody liked the fact that I'm attracted to drums right because this is too noisy and uh, trouble it's like trouble basically and but the point was that later on when I was in my high school times I was in a high school that uh, was the first one in Israel. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, It was the first one ever to have computer science as a major in a high school level. And you can imagine this was the 70s. So we didn't actually have a real computer at the school. It was only in Tel Aviv University where they had huge big rooms full of those machines that look today very, you know, vintage kind of stuff. So, um, but the whole point was that we learned a lot about algorithms, for example, and also some coding uh, languages that were, you know, the very basic, like basic, for example, if some of you know this kind of historical uh, stuff. Uh, Why do I say it? Because I was not really, uh, very attracted to it somehow. I think it, it was more chosen for me, maybe because of my grades or whatever that I ended up there, uh, to be honest. But I actually liked it. You know, it was fun. It was interesting. They always told us that we are going to be the future. But, you know, for a 14 years old boy, <laughs> the future is like this afternoon going to play the drums, right? So... <laughs> This is how it was, and when I finished the Lukio or the, the high school, I was already into learning medicine to become a medical doctor. This was like my big dream now. And I went for it. And then I knew, okay, music is behind. I left also computer sciences behind. I focused on that, became a doctor, I started working as a doctor, but at some point music came back to me, music. And uh, I moved out of Israel to Switzerland. And then I had a situation where I could actually learn music again seriously in a university level. So I went for it again, <laughs> following my, you know, my guts, basically. Nobody else liked the, this idea. And, um, and I fulfilled somehow my dream, which connect to what Peter said before. Remember in his uh, presentation, he was talking about uh, the Rovio guys in the beginning that his uh, suggestion to them or uh, 
advice was do what you like to do. You know, that's a big thing already. And um, so that's what I did. I actually combined medicine and that for a while. But when I moved to Finland about 20 years ago, it was obvious that uh, the music teaching career was open for me um, to jump in very easily. And that's what I did because I like teaching. So I teach now for 20 years to professional level, but also to amateur stuff. So informal learning, I was also involved, which had a lot of passion into it also, as you can imagine. And then that comes now the turn point from Big Ear Games point of view after this long introduction is that I recognize the problem, okay, in the music teaching. And it was all about how music works. So especially in Finland, people are very serious. I'm sure that also in Estonia, um, people are very serious about learning instruments, right? They invest a lot in the technicality and also in, you know, in music theory and, and other stuff. But the way music theory is, uh, is teached, and maybe some of you learned music at some point, it's, it will not be surprising. The music theory part and the how music work part is really dark science, very outdated in its uh, you know, methods, even the notes, you know, the traditional notes of music, they are like kind of very old and not really uh, intuitive if you think about today. So, Anyway, the point was like, people don't get it very easily, even they learned so many years already, this kind of stuff. So the point was, okay, let's change something. And I did some small research, you know, as a teacher with my own students and young ones, etc. And my conclusion was that people actually can get it quite easily, most people. You don't need to be any special, uh, but, the way we are teaching probably is the problem, actually. So I thought, okay, we have to change the way we are teaching because that's the only thing that we can change, actually, in this equation, right? Maybe the motivation also is one thing. So um, we thought, okay, writing a book about it, I was actually uh, offered to write a book about it. But then I said, book, you know, <laughs> it's about music. Again, you know, writing, or how, how people are going to get it. So the, um, then I saw also my own kids. And of course, you know, I, I had already a smartphone at this stage, obviously, an iPad, etc. And I thought, okay, this is the medium to work with, especially with youngsters, right? And many of us learning music or start learning when we are young enough. So I looked first at the market. This is now the entrepreneurship, right? So you have to do some kind of research to see my first uh, instinct, actually, was to look what is in the market already. And I was sure that somebody was doing it, right? So I found many tools and apps and gamified stuff to work it, uh, these kind of things out, but not exactly what I was talking about, which was the how music works. It was more about instruments, about making music in an easy way, like garage band and all this kind of loop stuff that is also offered quite a lot. But this was not the thing. So, um, okay, when I realized that maybe I have to do it, <laughs> I was like, okay, who is going to actually write the code? You know, you, you, you need somebody that will write the code and know also the engine, maybe it's going to be Unity, whatever. Um, then, you know, you have to scratch. <laughs> and luckily, again, I found somebody, a student here in Helsinki University, that knew Unity already a bit. And he was like quite fluent in it, actually. Not super professional, but fluent. You know, he could do stuff. So we created the first prototype. It took like, you know, once a week meeting uh, while we exchange ideas, kind of, uh, it was like ideation slash uh, creating the prototype already at the same time. So not really what a huge company maybe would do, that they would go through a very long process of, you know, segmenting all these uh, parts of the process. Um, then the point was, um, okay, we have a kind of a prototype that is playable. Uh, now we need to test it. We need to see that people are actually, you know, enjoy it, uh, feel that they are wasting their time in a valuable... Uh, and we took it to schools because we thought, okay, kids are the best 
um, testers because they are very honest. Even though you can say also on the other hand that you know in school if you give them anything they would play it right, but when we saw them playing 40, 45 minutes in straight ahead, you know, uh, and being happy about it, understanding also what it is with no, in the first prototype, we didn't have one word, one text, one word of text. And this was very important for us to see how people are getting it without any explanation. And when we saw that this was good and even the teachers were happy because obviously, you know, I brought in the know-how from the music uh, stuff. So obviously it had the value uh, very clearly there and the teachers were happy. So we started developing and we used some uh, schools here in Helsinki as our testers, basically. Then came the point that it was like, okay, it's growing and growing and growing. So we need to, you know, like business kind of, it's not anymore a hobby. You know, we need to put more time into it to be more dedicated and, uh, and then we started, I think the first uh, signal to us that we do something valuable from the finances point of view or how we are funding was a small grant from a uh, audiovisual AVEC in Finland. Um, and I, we got a small grant for developing more the idea. Then we got the bigger grant. And then we saw, wow, actually, you know, there's a way to attract funds to us. Uh, then we started, um, you know, okay, this part I left out by now, but I was very involved in many startup activities, right? And networking, learning about business, whatever you name it. And uh, this was very valuable. So you have to create yourself around you, people that are actually, people that have much more experience than you, which are giving you hints that, okay, you know, come on, leave it. This is nothing, you know, drop it. It's not really a good idea. Or they might say, hey, there's something here, you know, like dig more. And this was always the feedback to us, like dig more, dig more. Then um, at some point we, we could get also private investors to invest in us, like angels, right? They put, one of them was the speaker before me. And then when we gathered, like, I think it was four or five like that, angels, we thought, okay, this is really great. And we opened the company now because now you need to be a company. You cannot just get angels money uh, investment uh, for yourself. And then we started uh, running, to be honest, the first few months I had to, um, to go through finding a coder a more experienced coder because the guy from the university, remember the guy that we really started with me, the whole story, uh, was uh, going back to study for his master degree and he didn't have any more time to be full-time in the company. But again, uh, networks. Um, and again, it, this was actually not from the startup network. My son was playing basketball with somebody, no names, from a, a top guy from Supercell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I was asking him also this question, if, does he know anybody? And then when I actually start finding people, he could give a recommendation, you know, okay, I know this guy, he is good enough, go ahead. And I found this guy and this guy is still working with us, Leo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's the main coder that taking the whole Unity project on himself, plus some extra. Hmm. Okay, so um, we are coming here to a point that I'm already almost over time. Actually, uh, I just skipped the questions and the answers part because I'm really loving the story. And yeah, we do have a minute left, but do finish it, please. Great. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that now we are already working on it for a few years, developing business and, and uh, the product, of course. And um, it's... Um, there are many challenges uh, on the way. So the product cannot be the only thing that is there. Even though we have a very small team, <coughs> I'm putting a lot of my time into the business part, most of it actually, and I should even do more, right? So I should devote 100%, but of course, because we are a small team, I cannot allow myself uh, that now. But uh, um, the point is, is that you have 
to be very um, courageous many times and follow not only the advice of people, also your, uh, your, your own instinct, if you use, you know, like uh, common sense, right? Not like ideas that you bring out from the space. If you follow that, plus, uh, plus the um, advices that you get from people, hopefully that have much more experience than you, then you can make it. And remember my story, I didn't start as a game industry guy, right? I had no idea about that or no experience with that. But I came from another angle, but the angle was good enough to attract people from the industry that would think, okay, there's something there and we want to go for it. And now that happens more artists. often than you think, right? <laughs> exactly. Now we have artists, we have big companies and organizations that support us. If you open the game, now that's the idea. Uh, I was putting the links to our website, mm -hmm. we have downloads, to, uh, downloads uh, links to, to the game, obviously, but also something very interesting now, Genelec, do you know Genelec, the speaker company from Finland? Like one of the top high-end speakers? Probably not. Genelec, it's in the, if you follow the Genelec link, mm -hmm. <coughs> you will see that we are having now a special... Uh, a song for Santa uh, mm -hmm. challenge with them. And the winner is going to get the speakers, like home speakers of Genelec G1, which is like ah, nice. a, a pair cost usually like 600 euros and above. So mm -hmm. that's a good one. I'm just all trying right. to say that all these big brothers that are going with us in the USA, we have a very strong uh, support also. Mm -hmm. uh, this is super important to create... What Peter, uh, what Peter also was talking about, the brand thing, right? Yeah. So how your image for people is going to be. And we are doing something very good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most people don't, don't see the product or deep in the product when they just see the cover, right? Yeah. So the cover must be, you know, attractive enough in order to get you into it. Uh, the game looks like it's for kids, and actually it is more, it's for youngsters, kind of, right? But it goes very deep, so the cover is also a bit misleading here because also adults, even musicians play it, and they are very happy to get into the deeper into music, mm -hmm. new training, etc. So um, the call for action here, follow your guts. Everything that you learn in your life can support you. Even though what we do now, um, uh, my doctor degree doesn't help me with the knowledge that I learn. But you know, the moment people hear that I'm a doctor, so it's a little bit, you know, one more stone there yeah. in the building, right? Even though it has nothing to do with it. Really. So uh, whatever you do can actually support you at the end, right? So following your gut feeling and your true passion for something cannot go wrong if you really take it, you know, and, uh, and go for it. Fully agree. I follow your guts and what you love to do. Do things that you love to do and you are safe. Nice. I love the story. I've, <laughs> I've not heard this before. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's definitely do this again. Uh, I'm going to jump right on to the next speaker now. Uh, but if you have a moment, uh, we'll, share, we'll share the link of the live in uh, Zoom here. And there's uh, a lot of questions in English. So if you have a moment later, maybe you can answer a few of them. Okay. Thank All right. You. Uh, then next up, Oit Madis Osalit. Again. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Me, Masis Ragin Estigas. Ja lükkan oma ekraani käima teile. Ja ma räägin teile siis äh, natukene sellest, äh, kes ma olen, äh, mida ma teen ja kuidas ma sattusin seda tegema. Äh, ma olen... Äh, Okei. Okay. <laughs> Slaid läheb juba katki. Hea algus. Äh, Ühesõnaga. Mu nimi on Otmedes Osalit. Äh, ma olen lõpetanud Pakalaurus ja Kraadiga või siis Taltechis, erial siis arvutisüsteemid, mis tähendab seda, 
et nagu ka Aviv enne mind, ma ilmselgelt ei õppinud seda, kuidas mängi teha. Arvati süsteemid tähendas seda, et ma õppisin lihtsalt kolm aastat järjest põhimõtteliselt füüsikat ja matemaatikat. Mänge ma teen aastas 2013 ja ma nii viisi kõrvaltegevusena tegelen ka õpetamisega. See üks natukene komplementeerib ka teist. Aga mängudega ise ma olen seotud kuskil aastast 2003, kus ma alustasin siis mängu arendusega nii viisi, et ma sattusin ühe suvaka mängu peale, mis mul üks mängu seeria oli nimega Klonk, C-L-O-N-K. Ja siis kuidagi ühtus nii viisi, et ma sattusin seda tõlkima sakse ja inglise keelest eesti keelda. Ja see oli mu kõige esimene nagu tööots. Ma sain selle eest ka tasu nii öelda, mitte raha, aga ma sain elu aegs developer key, millega ma sain kõiki nagu edasi siis versioone sellest mängus siis tasuta mängida. Võt. Aga siia maani ma olen teinud päris mitud eri mängu, ma olen arendanud Disco Elysiumi, ma olen arendanud Heroes of Might and Magic 7, Tropico 6 ja nüüd hästi hiljuti Death and Taxesit. Ja lisaks ma olen teinud ka hästi palju enda mingisuguseid testprojekte, kus ma olen lihtsalt mingisuguseid mänguideid enda peast maha laadinud, arvutis see mingi mängu mootori lahti võtnud, selle idee sinna nagu välja purtsatanud ja siis vaadanud, et see on ilge jama ja siis ei ole viitsinud selle kedase tegeleda. Aga see on lihtsalt tunnud selleks, et oma enda oskusi harjutada. Nii, aga kuidas siis ma jõudsin selle nii? et mõlt sa mänge tegin, mis nagu sai sellest. Ma noorena mõtlesin, et mul on päris mitu sellist rada, kuhu ma võiksin nii-öelda tööle minna siis. Väga palju karjääri võimalusi. Üks neist oli see, et ma mõtlesin, et ma lähen teed tüüsse hoopiski keemiat õppima, et minus saab keemik. See nagu unistuskõdus täpselt siis ära, kui ma sain kätte oma keemia eksemi tulemused siis ma olin töötanud laos laotöölisena, nii et ma läksin nüüd logistika sektorisse minna. Ülikoolis ma tegelesin teadustööga, siis infosüsteemide vallas ja arvutisüsteemide vallas tegelikult. Ma läksin minud olla võrgutehnik, kes siis paigaldab või planeerib kohtvõrke suurtele ehitistele põhimõtteliselt. Ja lisaks ma võtsin ka, et minust võiks saada mängude testija, kuna kuhu ma jõudsin noorena pärast seda, kui ma hästi palju mänge mängisin, oli see, et ma hakkasin peeta testima nii palju erinevaid mänge, kui ma sain. Ma lihtsalt panin kirja ennast, et sign up for the beta ja siis lükkasin sinna oma applicationi sisse ja mõnikord tuli vastus, mõnikord ei tunnud ja ma üritasin olla hästi proaktiivne, et ma alati üritasin kuidagi väärtust juurde anda siis, et ma otsin mingisuguseid vigu sellest mängust või annan soovitusi ja need asi. Ja see nagu eskaleerus vaikselt ja tegelikult ma jõudsingi päris kaugele selles, et ma sain tänu Ubisofti Heroes of Might and Magic seeria siis disaini konsultantiks lõpuks, et ma alustasin sealt peeta testijana ja siis lõpuks minus nähti nii palju seda väärtust, mida ma nii lainsin, et nad tahtsid minu ka ja ka teiste kogukonna liikmetega siis jätkuvalt teha koostööd. Nii et ma kuskil 2004. aastast tegin seda ja ma tegin seda kuskil siis umbes kümme aastat, kuni ma läksin siis tegelikult ka selle sama seeria peale tööle, et Heroes of Might and Magic seeria seitsmas osa siis oli minu ka esimene mängu töökoht, et minust ei saanud keemikud, minust ei saanud võrgutehnikud ega midagi sellest. Ja miks ma mängud valisin siis ja miks ma ei läinud näiteks ja no keemikuks ma läinud sellepärast, et mul läks seks on peki, aga Mängud kui selline tööstusena ei tundunud mulle väga realistlik asja, et mida ma saaksin tegelikult üldse teha sellepärast, et ma lihtsalt mõtlesin, et noh, et teatud inimesed teevad neid on ja et need, kelle on need oskused, nendel on ja ma ei teanud, kus need oskuseid saada, nii et ma lihtsalt ei mõelnudki, et ma võiksin seda teha ja sellepärast ma ei võtnud seda kunagi tõsiselt, et ma võiksin kunagi mänge teha, et mida... 
ma hakkasin mängu tööstusest kõige esimesena tegema, oli siis tõlkimine, järgmisena testimine, aga tänu sellel, et ma õppisin arvutisesteeme ja matemaatikat ja füüsikat, ma õppisin ka progema. Ja ülikooli ajal juba ma õpetasin endast noorematele siis praktilistest tundides programmeerimist. Ja mida see mulle andis, oli selline veidurunikaalne kombinatsioon, et ma oskasin matemaatikat, füüsikat ja progemist. Ja see on täpselt see kogemuste pakas, mida on mängu progejana vaja. Ja see tundub suhteliselt müstika, eks ole, et see, see võib olla nagu väga sür no, selline kogemus üldse, kui esimest korda üritada mängu progeda, et asjad peavad liikuma kuidagi, mingisugus asjal peaks olema kiirus, mingisugus asjal vaja vajutada, et see on suhteliselt nagu, jah, keeruline asi, mida lahti harutada enda jaoks, kui, kui sellega alustad eriti, et see ei ole nagu, see ei ole ka nii-öelda tavaline progemine, et see ei ole see, et sa programmeerid mingisust pesumasinat või, või lennuki autopilooti või siis veebilehte, et see on väga missiooni põhine, sa tahad, et mingis on jubelaklases liiguks nagu teatud kohta ja selle jaoks on sul vaja teatud teadmisi ja need teadmised tulevad ainult läbi kogemuse ja minu õnneks siis mul olid need kogemused olemas ja mis juhtus mis mulle meeldis Avivi loo puhul oli ka see, et mul oli kogemata mingisugune nagu selline oskuste kongroeerimine. Mul oli nagu mitu erinevat oskust, mis olid natukene välja arendatud, aga see andis mulle sellise hea baasi selleks, et tegelikult mängudes edasi liikuda. Ja ma sain sellest alla aru siis, kui ma olin oma ülikooli kõige viimasel aastal. Ja sinna... No, läksid kõige aega, eks ole, aga lõpuks ma sain aru, et okei, okay, ma olin piisavalt kaua juba näinud kõrvalt ka, siis äh, seda mängu tegemist, seal Ubisoftis äh, nõuandes, et äh, mul oli piisavalt teadmis, et kuidas see tööstus enam vähem toimib, mul oli nüüd kontaktid ja siis oligi nii viisi, et ma pärast äh, nii pea, kui ma oma diplomi kätte sain, paari nädala pärast ma lendasin Saksamaale äh, ühte mängu firmasse ja Läksin sinna tööle põhimõtteliselt. Kõigepealt ma läksin interviule ja mul oli tagasi lennupilet ka ostetud igaks juhuks, aga seda tagasi lennupiletit ma ei lunastanud. Ma lihtsalt ei läinud sinna lennukile, et ma jäin kiliselt Saksamaale ja siis ma olin seal tükka aega. Ja õppisin mängi tegema. Ja miks ma endiselt mängi teen, on see, et see on minu jaoks oluline. Ma saan ennast teostada selles, ma saan ennast väljendada Ma saan jutustada sellised lugusid nagu ma tahan, ma saan jutustada ka teiste lugusid, mis mulle väga meeldib ja põhiliselt ma teen mänge nüüd sellepärast, et ma saan neid teha, sellepärast, et nagu enne mainisin, ma ei teadnud, et see nagu võiks olla mingis reaalne karjääri valik, aga nüüd kui ma tean, et see on, siis ma ausalt ei tahaks mitte midagi muud teha. See on põhimõtteliselt mu elu. Ja kui keegi teist mõtleb, et kust alustada üldse, kui tahaks mänge teha, et see tahe on olemas, siis ma ütlen, et see on juba väga suur asi, sellepärast, et tahe ongi põhiline asi, mis olemas peab olema, kui mänge tahta teha. Et alustada võib väga erinevatest kohtadest, alustada võib vabakutselisena, nagu Matthias enne mainis, võib teha tellimustööid, põhimõtteliselt commissioneid, et kui sa oled progeja, kui sa oled kunstnik, sa võid lihtsalt oma oskusi müüa internetis turul nii öelda, kas Redditis või Fiveris või kus siganeseks ole, et endale neid oskusi luua. Lisaks võib alustada ka mängu tegemisega oma haridusteel ja see ei ole tingimata nii, et sa pead minema mängu tegemist õppima, et sa võid näiteks õppima minna programmeerimist, sa võid minna õppima kunsti ja siis sa kuidagi ühendad selle õppetöö oma mängu loomis pisikuga, et sa üritad, et kas või pakkuda oma õpetajatele, professoritele, juhendatele välja, et kuule, et ma tahaks teha sellist asja nagu nii viis, et võibolla ma teeksin sellest mingisuguse digitaalse asja või siis ma teeksin sellest konkreetselt mingi mängu. Ja kui juba mingisugused oskused on olemas, siis võib juba hakata mõtlema investeeringute peale, et kas keegi tahaks äkki rahasta seda, seda kuidas ma, noh, minu mingisugust unistust, eks ole, kas ma siis teen mingisuguse prototüübi mingisugusest mängust ja siis vaatan, et kas keegi tahaks selle peale raha visata või siis vaadata, et aha, et mul on äkki piisalt palju 
kontakte võrgustikus, et meil on mitu vabakutse sellest koos, et äkki keegi tahab meie nagu nii-öelda vabakutseliste outsourcing studio peale näiteks raha visata, investeerida, eks ole. Ja see on kõik selline alus tuleviku, et neid võimalusi, kust alustada on väga palju, aga lihtsalt tuleb enda jaoks sobiv koht leida. Ja mida ma tahaksin hästi palju rõhutada, on see, et julgege unistada suurelt, aga üritaga alustada väikeselt, et nagu Peter enne rääkis, et 51 mängu sai tehtud enne kui 52. hittis, et see on selline, noh, mõnikord on raske ennast tagasi hoida, et tahaks kohe kõige esimese asjana oma unistust ja mängu teha, eks ole, ja kui sellega läheb õnneks, on hästi, aga kui ei lähe... MMORPG, nii? Jah, näiteks, eks ole... Alati on see, et teeme FPS-i või teeme MMORPG, siis on see, et kui lõpuks välja tuleb, kui palju see tööd võtab, siis on, oh my god, mis toimub ja siis maailm varisub kokku. Kõigepealt ongi see, et see baas on hästi oluline ja kui vähegi võimaneks, siis seda arendada, aga see ei tähendaks, et kunagi tulevikus saaks selle unistuse täida viia. See on täiesti tühislaid, miski pärast, aga põhimõtteliselt see on minu poolt kõik. Kui on küsimusi, siis ma vastan nendele kui aega on. Jah, saame paar küsimust võtta. Kõige populaarsem küsimus, et ma siis osalik, milline roll oli sul Disco Elysiumi loomisel? Okei, milline roll mul ei olnud? Tähendab, Disco Elysium arendus oli selles mõttes eriline, et väga palju pidi olema paindlikust selles. Ma läksin siin alguses progejana siis ma hakkasin tegema seal kvaliteedi kontrolli ja siis edasi vahepeal ma põikusin mõjale, tulin sinna ringiga tagasi ja siis ma hakkasin produktsiooni ja siis mänensimise peal töötama ja lõpuks hakkasin ka välispartneritega suhtlema. Et lihtsalt point oli selles, et mul oli see oma kogemuste pagas, mis mul oli aastate jooksul kogunenud ja ma sain seda kõike seal rakendada paresega, kus vaja oli ja tuletavasti olin ka selle tõttu abiks. Nois, kõlab tüüpiliselt. Jah, indiga viil kõlab nüüd live. Et meeskonna koos olek, vaatad backlogi ja siis ütled, et okei, on kõige aega märku, kes seda oskab teha. Jah, põhimõtteliselt, sellepärast, et sellist augutäitjat on igas olukorras vaja ja kui on sellised inimesi, kes suudavad võtta erinevaid rolle, siis see tähendab ka, et su väärtus tõuseb. Et see ongi see, et et näiteks Avivil on arsti haridus, et tõenäoliselt sellega saaks ka mingisuguseid mängi teha, aga põhimõtteliselt on selles, et selle võimaluse leidmine võib olla keeruline. Enda jaoks tuleb see võimalus luua. Üks viimane küsimus veel sulle, et kuidas arendada endas loojutustamise ekstoritellingu oskust ja kui oluline see on mängu aranduses? Kui tahta teha narratiivi põhiseid mänge ja selliseid sügava mõttelisi mänge, selliseid, mis siis räägivad mingitest konkreetsetest teemadest või kellegi eluloost või ajaloost või midagi, siis ma ütleks, et hästi, hästi oluline on lihtsalt üritada arendada oma väljendusoskust. Väljendusoskus on üldiselt hästi oluline asi, kui olla näiteks mängudisainer eriti, kui mängudisainerina su ülesanne on rääkida teistele inimestele oma tiimis, mida nad tegema peavad tegelikult, kuidas asi teostatud peab saama. Ja väljendusoskus on number üks oskus, mis sul peab olema. Sa pead oskama kirjutada, sa pead oskama rääkida, sa natukene võib-olla võiks osata isegi joonistada ja neid oskusi saab arendada ainult tehes. Ehk siis, kui sa tahad jutustada mingisugust loovat lugu, siis hakka kirjutama, kirjuta see välja, kirjuta kas või bullet pointidena välja, siis kirjuta väikene tekstilõik ja siis sealt kirjuta juba mingisugune selline väikene skript, et siis kirjuta selline storyboard endale, et samm haaval lõpuks sa hakkad aru saama enda peas ka, kuidas see lugu peaks jutustuma ja kui sa oled sinna jõudnud, kui sul on mingisugune selline veits holistiline pilt asjadest ees, kuidas asjad kokku jooksevad, siis sa tõenäoliselt ka hakkad oskama seda väljendada. Nais. Uff, mulle juba meeldib see event nii palju täna, et me võiks iga omiks seda tegema. 
nagu iga omik tunda aega erinevate inimestega ja siis kõik saad kuulata läbi laivi. Anyway, Kuulult inspireeriv. Jah, äh, aitäh sul oit. Äh, samamoodi aitäh. hüppasin nad chati vastama nele küsimusele, kui aega leiad kamba peale saame rohkem ära vastata ja nüüd siis jõuame viimase speakerini Hello Flavio uh, Flavio is our CTO the um, guy who moved from the other side of the world to live in Berno for some reason but he can tell you all about it why he chose to do that Well, hello uh... Well, I still don't know why I did that, but I'm very happy that, that I did it. Uh, well, my name is Flavio. I'm the CTO of GameCan. And uh, I started uh, my gaming life uh, very early. And uh, my, uh, since the beginning, since, since I was a, a, a little kid, I, I was kind of um uh, amazed by by computers uh, uh whenever i i seen a, a computer next to me i couldn't uh, help myself and uh, just go close to it and you know try to touch it and the keyboard and mouse and everything that that thing always uh, amazed me and uh well the the first thing that when you're a kid that you want to do with computers uh it's playing something uh, on that thing. And uh, back in the days, uh, we had very uh, rough games, uh, very, uh, uh, it was at the very beginning. And uh, so uh, I started playing games like uh, Wolfenstein and Doom and uh, Quake, Golden Axe, uh, th those real classic games. And uh, well, the that sparked uh, something on me. And uh, well, at nine years old, uh, I, I learned how to program. Uh, I got a, a, a basic language, it's called basic, uh, that language. And uh, I got a manual of it and started reading it. And my first uh, actual software was I made the keyboard turn into a little piano. Uh, <clears throat> And well, after that, uh, I went into software development career, of course. Uh, what else? And uh, and went into what I call today boring software development. Uh, those kind of uh, 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 software that uh, manages clients and you know all that thing like business intelligence software at some point i was programming uh point of sale machines those machines where you put your card to to pay <clears throat> and then things started getting interesting i started my own business and at some point uh, uh i didn't want to continue with my business anymore and i started looking for uh uh career change to do something else with my life because it was just boring software development and uh well at that point i started actually testing games uh and making some money out of it and i started with testing really simple games for small studios and at some point i was testing the big ones uh triple a games uh and all that and guys you complain about how cyberpunk is buggy you have no idea how the be beta of other triple a games is buggy <laughs> you have absolutely no idea <laughs> and uh it was super fun uh, it helped me learn a lot about gaming industry, how the process of making a game works and uh, what, what's involved and all that. And at some point I caught myself learning Unreal Engine <clears throat> uh, because I really, really wanted to, to get into game development itself. And uh, I got myself learning an Unreal Engine and I got my first job uh, eventually uh, in the industry and uh, 
I just from there I just started making games. It became my my passion with everything, and it's uh, for me, uh, it was the <clears throat> the happiest decision that I made in my life to change from from boring software software dev uh, to something more exciting because making games uh, presents you a different challenge every day. Uh, something that it's uh, you you have to talk with a bunch of different people from different areas. Uh, you have to handle artists. They are crazy. You have to handle designers. They're even crazier. And you have to handle programmers. Those are insane. And uh, you end up with a <laughs> pretty good mix, actually, at the end. And it's awesome because of that, uh, because all, all of those different people, all of uh, those different challenges that uh, you face in the industry. And uh, uh, well, here I am <laughs> working with it. Uh, and uh, well, one thing that I was seeing on the comments of, of, of the live uh, is that one guy was actually asking, uh, uh, he said that his dream was to get into uh, uh, game testing. And if you ever thought yourself on that position, oh, I want to test games. And people will tell you that it's boring and it's hard and all that. And no, it's not. It's super fun. Um, because first you get to play games before they are released. And if you love video games, come on. And you get to understand. So that's how I joined the industry. That's how I began uh, my entire path. And I do recommend. So if it's, I, I think more than one person said this here. Uh, if your gut feeling is telling you, uh, I want to do this, uh, just go do because uh, it eventually uh, pays off. Um, so I prepared uh, a, a small demonstration of how uh, is the process of making a game, uh, a small thing. Let me switch my video feed one sec there you go i think you guys can see my camera and my screen now right yep okay so when you actually open download uh, one of those uh commercial engines uh uh like a real engine or unit uh the engine will ask you to create a new project and uh, it varies the way you do this. Uh, and that one is a real engine, uh, which I'm gonna show you. So you come here, select games, and uh, it has some templates in here for you. And we're gonna go with side scroller. And you click next, you give your project a name. Let's call it hoop two, because I have hoop one that I created before just to test some stuff. Okay, one moment. Um, maybe it's only me on Zoom, but it seems uh, very low resolution. Do you think you have some? Oh, options? yes. Yeah, I was actually afraid of that. But let's one sec. I can mm -hmm. switch back in here to my full screen camera. And I can sh share the screen. <clears throat> okay. Oh, much better. <laughs> Okay, nice. Uh, move this around. So, when you actually create a template on a real engine, you end up with something like this. So, you get a character that runs around already. I press space and the character jumps. So, yeah, that's pretty much the beginning of a game. That's how it works. And uh, let's make things a little bit more interesting. I have some assets in here that I prepared. So let me just grab those and I'm on the folder. One sec. And the way you do this, this is the folder with the with the assets. So I'm gonna put some stuff in here. Make it look cooler. 
and a character. Character, I need to restart the project. All right, there we go. So we have a small character that we made for uh, testing, like making prototypes here uh, with our studio. This is a game canner. This is not the best version of it. Uh, there is, who did this was Matthias, super awesome. <clears throat> but we're gonna use this one. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and here and change a few things on so this guy. So I don't want this guy, so I'm gonna change it for our game canner character. Big, and I'm gonna give him some movement. I hope this is the one. No, this is not the one. This is the one. Nice. Let's make it smaller. Maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and 0.6. This is the scale of the character. And we're gonna go ahead and also make this a little bit smaller. Oh, this is the capsule. This is how every character on 3D video games move around. He is actually, the character is almost always a capsule with some mesh inside. We call this mesh. It's the graphical representation of the character. Yeah, that should be good enough. And when I come here, I have this. Our character is already animated. Mind blown. <laughs> and, uh, well, all right. Uh, so for a game to be a game, you need to have uh, something like a, uh, an enemy of some sort. So we're going to go ahead and I have this farm animals pack. So why not? But chickens, right? I have a cute little chicken in here that does this amazing, just amazing that chicken, amazing chicken. I bet it's tasty as well. Uh, so let's create a blueprint in here and it's gonna be a character. Let's call it, why not chicken? A blueprint is basically, uh, how do I explain a blueprint? It's basically uh, uh, an asset, something that contains a bunch of logic and a bunch of movement code already done by the engine for you. Uh, and the capsule is already here and the mesh is already here as well. Uh, that's the, the actual job of game engines is to provide something uh, already uh, made uh that you can use to make your life a lot easier so again let's reshape this capsule this is too big i think maybe 25 in here and a smaller and let's give it a minus 25 and nice and like by magic, we have our, chi our chicken. Now let's put this chicken on the X axis, on the same X axis of our character. Let's put it here, rotate it a little bit to 90. And there you go, you have a chicken. But the chicken is static, so it's the same thing of our character. We need to give it some movement, right? So I have something pre-made in here, I hope so. Yes, for the movement. This is what we call an animation blueprint. And on the animation blueprint, you handle anim animation logic. So I have this idle animation ready. Uh, if I wanna switch it to the idle to animation that I think it's not very different. Yeah, the same thing. We just plug and play. And there you go. But no, actually, this one is more dynamic, moves more. Yep, nice. And of course, 
let's do the Super Mario thing. So if I jump on the chicken, uh, something happens with the chicken. And so how do you do that? I'm gonna first come here on the capsule and I'm gonna say when something hit that chicken, right? Let's get a name in here just so we see what happens with that chicken. Work. Okay, you can see in there on the top left. See, when something hits, it's telling me what hit it, the chicken. Okay. Now that we know that this works, I'm gonna check if this is actually a side scroll character, that it's my character. If it is my character, I'm gonna have to do some very, very advanced math in here. I'm gonna get the actor location, the other actor that hit the chicken. I'm gonna get my chicken location. Wish I had get chicken location would be awesome. And I'm gonna open this. So it will give me a vector, like pretty much the math vector that you guys know. So it has X, Y, and Z inside that vector. X, Y, and Z in here can represent a location, a point on a 3D space, or it can represent a direction. In this case, it will represent uh, a location, right? So I'm gonna do this. If this Z location is bigger than the chicken location, Z, this is not gonna work very well. I'm gonna get this capsule of height as well. And we're gonna do a sum in here. It's a little bit more, yeah, nice. Okay, so this means, this basically means if I'm jumping on top of the chicken, uh, I'm gonna do something with it. A branch in here and if it's true for now I'm gonna just print hello see uh oh there is wrong in there if my actor location is Z it's bigger you know what Let's do like this. So print in hello. Good. I'm an excellent game programmer. <laughs> we can solve that later. So, and that's why games have bugs. Uh, so if the character actually hits the, the, the chicken, I'm gonna play an animation on the chicken. It's gonna be chicken death. That's the first thing. All right, she can die. And uh, after that, I'm gonna actually wait a little bit. I'm gonna wait like two seconds. And then I'm gonna destroy the chicken. Oop. There you go. So yep, one, two, and chicken is gone. So that's the basic on how you make a, a test enemy for yourself. Oh, by the way, and if you guys have uh, any questions, <laughs> rest in peace chicken, yes. Uh, if you guys have any questions, just drop it as I'm making. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So chicken died. I'm not sure why this is not working. Get actor location. Okay, Z if Z of my character is bigger than the Z of the chicken. Oh, of course, it's the capsule component in here that I need to. Duh. Uh, 
I was going to say you have five minutes to fix this before we end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, no, we can take like 10, 10, 10 to finish this uh, game and ship it. Oh, come on. If CD Projekt Red can ship a buggy game, we can also do it. No? Yeah, of course. Too soon? <laughs> uh, okay. This should work now. I hope so. Okay, nice. Nice. And if I just approach from the... Also not working. Great. We can ship it. We can publish it through Bethesda. It will work. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how uh, you do basic stuff. Uh, you actually do this noodle thing in here and you connect pins and stuff and suddenly it becomes a game and then you just sell it on Steam and you make millions. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, someone asked, what's the application? It's Unreal Engine. Um, any questions for Flavio? <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are no specific questions, uh, then again, uh, the link I posted before, uh, the bit.ly slash estgamedev. Um, oh, actually, there is a question now. Uh, first, come to that uh, Estonian game development Discord if you have any questions and uh, you are kind of intrigued by game development. You don't know how to start, where to start, what to download, then that's the best place to go. Uh, there's a question that I'm going to let you answer. It's how long did it take to make Overstep? Um, it's not ready yet, but... Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Overstep. Uh, first of all, uh, Overstep. It's uh, it's far from from end, uh, and uh, since it's a free play game, uh, it maybe will never uh, be done uh, fully. Uh, but uh, well, Overstep. Uh, we 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 reset it completely. The development of Overstep. Uh, like a few times, I think. How, how many times? Like five times, right, Martin? Probably, yeah. Yeah, but but that's also part of of game development itself. You you sometimes you you scrap uh, what you have, not just in terms of code, but in terms of everything. Like our UI was redesigned so many times, and. Uh, like our robots, we, 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 we're rebuilding our robots right now. We, uh, we rebuilt uh, levels, uh, art style in general. So that happens. But uh, Overstep on, uh, on the way it is right now, uh, on his current code base, let's call it like that, uh, it has been two years. I think that that code base is two years old. Uh, and we have one more year planned one more year uh, to go uh, with that development of this code base, uh, hoping to hit a, a final uh, uh, release version on November next year. Maybe we'll drop some yellow thing post on Twitter, apologizing and, you know, happens. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much uh, how the development. And it, it's it's super fun because Overstep is a complex game, and uh, with complex systems, it's a it's a free to play online game, and it so you have to deal with servers and uh, uh, and a store and a bunch of cool things actually. Great, um, I'm gonna continue in Estonian. And um, right. you can chat with people in the uh, Messenger live chat. Eesti keeles siis. Aitäh kõigile, et vaatsite. Ma loodan, et me teeme taolis asju tulevikus veel. Päris korralik kulk huvilisi, mis me kindlasti proovime teha, on see, et kui te registreerides seal Google Formsis esitasite küsimusi, 
siis me prooviks need trutrut ära vastata ja teile meili peale saata. Tulge Discordi, ajame seal juttu, aitame hea meele ka võit Mattias viimaseid sõnu, Flavio, any last words? Ma ütleks võibolla ainult seda, et tulge julgelt kindlasti Discordi, ättige mind näiteks kas või ma olen Discordis nimega Oak Warrior, nagu tamme seda on ajatud ingise keeles. Lihtsalt tulge hashtag general kanalis, öelge tere, öelge, kelleks te tahate saada, mida te tahaksite teha mängude eestuses, rääkige meil on unistuste mängu projektidest, mida iganes, et selles mõttes, mida rohkem inimesi seal on, seda uhkem. Ja kui on vähegi soovi mängutööstuses tulla ja sinna jääda, siis alustamiseks ei ole vaja mitte midagi muud peale tahtmist, et oskused kõik tulevad hiljem ja alati leiab mingisuguse viisi, kuidas oma oskusi siis suurendada. Tulge, küsige, olge proaktiivsed. Nõus. Flavi, you wanted to add something? If you like games and if you like, if you ever play the game and you say, and you thought, I would do this differently, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I could change this or that. Uh, consider uh, game development. Consider uh, going for for games, because it, you you have the opportunity to do that, uh, to make your own words, uh, to make your own characters, to make your own. Uh, 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 your own experiences and it makes everything fun uh, trust me it, it, well if you're young uh, and uh, I bet you have that thing with math that uh, most of us uh, when we were young we had and uh, when you get into game development actually you start to like math for some reason uh, I guess it's because uh, uh, it things start making sense. It's the Stockholm uh, syndrome. It takes yeah. you hostage. <laughs> it takes you hostage. Uh, <laughs> but uh, not in a bad way, not, not in a non-fun way. It's, it's, uh, it's really fun to have those math problems in game development because when you solve them, you can actually see something happening on your screen and it's super fun when it goes wrong it's also it's even better <laughs> you know when you're playing gta or another game and the character just goes boom flying yeah that's a math problem <laughs> so yeah uh go go ahead uh that there is room uh for for everyone for people that likes to write for people that likes music for people that likes to uh, uh draw characters uh that wants to be an artist that wants to be a programmer uh there is room for everyone so and it's the it's the dream job like uh, i still feel like a kid nowadays like doing what i do and i love it so yeah thank you flavio mattias viimas it's you know Loodan, et mängu arendajad tuleb nüüd nagu seini peale vihma ja ma loodan, et Eesti mängu arendus kene kasvab jõudsalt ja me ootame kõiki uusi uilisi ja ma soovin kõiki teile head jõuluaega ja puhkust ja see on minu poolt kõik. Thanks. Tänu tesinejatele ja minu poolt siis viimane asja, et suur tänu Pärnu Noorte ja Innovatsioonikeskuse huub meeskonnale, kes on siis tehniliselt imeliselt teostanud selle ürituse ilma, et meil ühtiga apsakat oleks. Ja nüüd me paneme üles ka salvestuse üritusest, YouTube'i, Facebook'i ja kui te tunnete, et teil on mõni sõber, kes oleks peandud seda kuulama, siis kindlasti saate neile pärast linki jagada. 
Aga meie poolt kõik Gamecon ja Huub tänavad esinejad ka ja näeme järgmine kord.